Bill Maley with the AGL Association. Uh, we are a nonprofit that aims to transform government and help it modernize through shared knowledge and community building. Uh, today we have a special guest, Dave Zavenich, uh, former executive director of 18F. Uh, Dave is a nationally recognized expert in technology procurement and open source software. Uh, Dave will talk about his fascinating time working in the federal government. Uh, he also was general counsel to the D.C. Council in Washington, D.C., and uh, is writing a book called Joyful Procurement, The Art of the Digital Service Acquisition. Uh, so just as a reminder, we are recording today's session and we'll post it online after the event. Please keep your microphones muted until we go to Q&A about halfway through the program. In the meantime, please feel free to post your questions in the field at the bottom of your screen and we'll keep track of those. So uh, now uh, before we get into the uh, Q&A with Dave, uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit about Code California. Uh, this is something that uh, was launched in in December uh, as, a, um, as a movement. It, it's based on a policy that was issued by the California Government Operations Agency in, in May. Uh, actually that was the California Department of Technology. Uh, it was a policy on open source uh, use uh, in the state of California. And since then, uh, this Code California movement has been launched uh, to have a playbook and a community behind it. So a playbook of very detailed uh, sort of operational level, how to implement open source uh, in an enterprise way throughout the state of California and at the local level. Uh, and uh, this is something, again, that was launched in December so it's, it's a movement, it's something that folks can participate in, and it's very much uh, meant to be an iterative process, uh, much uh, like, uh, you know, agile development. So uh, with that, uh, I would like to uh, thank uh, Dave for joining us today. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for having me, it's a delight to be here. So uh, before we get into the December 12th event, which you flew to California uh, to join us and help launch the Code California uh, uh, community, um, I'd, I'd be interested in, in hearing more about your background. We know you were the executive director uh, at 18F, uh, which um, is a fairly new organization within the federal government still. It was launched under the Obama administration. I was wondering if you could just give a little bit of background. Sure. Um, well, I, I'll, I'll talk about 18F first, and then I'll talk about me, um, and actually a little bit about uh, sort of how, the, how they met in the middle, <laughs> how we met in the middle. Um, so... Uh, 18F uh, is, is a new organization, um, and um, the, uh, the thing that's been interesting about 18F is that it's an organization that um, is uh, filled with people from different backgrounds, from varied backgrounds, uh, some private sector, some public sector, some uh, not-for-profits, uh, some uh, from um, civil society, some from, you know, the Valley um, and really a bunch of folks came together with this, with the same central mission of changing how the government builds, buys, and, uh, and borrows and, and shares uh, digital services. Um, it was started uh, before healthcare.gov, but definitely got some, uh, some fire in its uh, you know, belly after healthcare.gov. Um, but the movement started actually much before healthcare.gov. Um, the movement started in uh, the, uh, arguably in the late 2000s, um, when there was a starting uh, sort of awareness around the importance of open data uh, and the open government community sort of rallied behind this idea of open data. Um, you had uh, groups like the Sunlight Foundation, um, POGO, and others who were focusing on uh, good uh, open governments. Code for America formed around that same time. Um, you had organizations like CFPB uh, and the federal government, uh, organizations like the, uh, formerly the Office of uh, Citizen Information, something or other called, it was previously OXIT, and now it's OPP, uh, within the General Services Administration that was handling things like data.gov, uh, search.gov, uh, usa.gov, and others, uh, other other properties out there. Um, and so there, there had been sort of this movement that was, that's, that was happening, uh, like I said, in the late 2000s, early 2010s, um, and I uh, was sort of sitting uh, from a totally different perspective. I, I'm an attorney. I was uh, a lawyer uh, and working as the general counsel for the D.C. Uh, legislature. Um, but I got, to, I got to know folks in the civic tech community and the legal tech community, and I was just astonished by how um, different uh, the thinking was around how to approach uh, government problems. Um, one of the things that that's, I, 
I've seen and felt in governments is this sense of sort of a learned helplessness. You sort of, you know, you try to change things, you try to change things. And at some point you just say, well, that's just how government is. Um, and what was really exciting uh, and great about uh, the folks that had the opportunity to work with at ATF and beyond uh, is this sort of recognition that no, it doesn't have to be this way. Their systems are, you know, it's a system, uh, but you can, you can use certain uh, ways to change how the system behaves and operates. Uh, and it doesn't require a great deal of uh, tweaking, actually, just small little tweaks uh, can have really profound downstream impacts. Um, and so I had the opportunity to join ATF uh, in 2015, um, uh, started the acquisition team there, uh, had the opportunity to lead at ATF for about a year, and then served as a uh, assistant commissioner in the Federal Acquisition Service, uh, responsible for most of the federal procurement systems. Um, that if you if you want to geek out about federal procurement systems, I could go all day. Um, I did leave the government uh, in October of 2018, uh, and since then I uh, I've been working both with uh, with companies that are trying to work with government. Uh, as well as government to try to figure out how to work with uh, companies uh, that are uh, doing things in a different way uh, and learning how to how to use modern practices to purchase uh, to purchase digital service and technology and the obligatory plug I am writing a book thank you Bill for mentioning it uh, I am writing a book called joyful procurement you can go to joyfulprocurement.com and sign up for a mailing list uh, about sort of the updates um, but the, the goal there is to really think about how do we take the principles from the digital services playbook and apply them to, uh, to acquisition. So uh, I don't know if that's enough of an overview of me, uh, but that, that's sort of where I'm coming from. Sure. No, thank you for that. Uh, so my first question, you are, you are an attorney. Uh, you're, an, you're a procurement expert. Why is procurement so central in this whole theme? When we're talking about technology and code and developers and software, What's the big deal about procurement? Why is it so important? So procurement is important for a lot of different reasons. Um, but one of the reasons that procurement is so, uh, so critical is that, uh, well, there's actually two reasons. So first reason um, is that there's a, there's a really significant mismatch uh, going on when it comes to procurement. Um, most folks, when they think about procurements, they say it's broken, it's broken, it's broken. And when they use the language of procurements, they talk about how do you get into a contract in the first place? Uh, but for anyone who's been in government long enough and sort of seen procurement long enough, what actually is, it's not the problem of how you get into the contract, it's what happens once the contract is in administration. Um, and so one of the things that I, I had really tried to, uh, to focus on when I was at 18F and, and beyond is to focus on how do you get to the contract stage? Sure, that's important, but how do you focus on having a good, healthy relationship after the contract is awarded? How do you have the right processes in place? How do you have the right communication patterns with, uh, with industry and with your internal partners uh, to do it? Um, and once you start to make some of those, again, some of those small little adjustments, it can have really profound uh, effects in terms of the experience for, uh, for, for government. So one reason that procurement is so important is because it's such a small little thing to change just the, you know, just the focus can change a lot of our expectations uh, and experience around procurement. So that, that's reason number one. Reason number two is that um, procurement is actually, uh, it's, it's an event, right? So there aren't a lot of triggering events in, in government. You have policy, there'll be a new policy, and when there's a new policy, you have an opportunity to influence how something might go or not. Um, procurement's the same way. You're bringing on new people, you're bringing on new expectations, you're setting a direction for, uh, for the agency. Um, and so procurement is a, is a moment, it's an opportunity to say, how are we gonna, how are we gonna organize ourselves in a way that's gonna best serve the public? Um, and you don't have a lot of those opportunities, um, particularly because procurements are structured typically in five-year you know, chunks. Um, so I, I look at procurement as an opportunity to say, how do we get everybody together? How do we sort of align our, our, ourselves and have a clear sense of goal and mission and then execute on that? Um, that's really powerful. Um, and so I, I, I find that it's a good place to focus um, because like I said, there aren't, there aren't a lot of opportunities in government uh, to, have, to have consistent impact and procurements are always that opportunity. Uh, here's a basic question, very basic. Um, why do we need vendors in the first place? Why do we need contractors? I, I know, you know, we have to buy software, right? Mm -hmm. the, the government typically isn't in the business of, of developing its own software, but that's not completely true. Um, why do we need vendors? And what's, what's the landscape and, and what's the balance of government employees doing this work versus vendors? 
Yep. So there's there's an unfortunate um, paradigm uh, that's that you know it's and there's good motivation behind it, but it, it comes out the wrong way, which is the idea of build versus buy. Um, everything is a build versus buy binary decision, um, and the reality is that things change. Uh, software in particular, and we can talk about beyond software, focusing narrowly on software delivery. Things change over time. You you might have an application that you've built um, th three years from now six months from now, it might not be the best thing anymore. There might be a service that's available that you should just use or someone else has built a better tool that, than, than what you've built and you should just use that. Um, and so part of what's challenging about uh, software delivery is that if you have this sort of mindset that everything has to be built internally, you're, you're going to fail, right? You can't build everything yourself. You shouldn't build everything yourself. You're going to need to rely on external services and external parties to get, to get stuff done. Um, but by contrast, if you outsource everything, including your brain, you're not going to be able to get good results because if you're in the service delivery business and the only people who actually are accountable to service delivery are not accountable to the people who you know, require the service delivery in the first place, you're going to get bad outcomes. Um, and so really the, the art uh, is to figure out what's, instead of the binary build versus buy, um, it's how do you know what to build at the right time and how do you know what to buy at the right time and how do you have the right the, the right layers, the right um, boundaries, the right uh, sort of expectations, and you can debate what those are so that you can say, all right, we no longer need to build this internally. We can now ship this to an external service and we can refocus our energy toward, you know, to other higher value purposes. Um, and that, that's a question for leadership. Uh, it's a question of value uh, as opposed to project delivery. Um, and it's, it's frankly a very difficult uh, and, and meaty topic. But I, I find that procurement has to exist you, even in a you know in any corporate structure you're buying most of the stuff we're using zoom it would be insane to buy build your own zoom each time um, and so thinking about what the right uh, expectations in terms of build versus buy uh, is is part of you know frankly modern uh, modern life so at our event in december this was uh december 12th in sacramento uh co-hosted by the government operations agency to launch at code california we had some major software brands on stage uh, related uh, to open source. They were there to talk about their open source direction. Uh, we had Red Hat uh, and IBM and Microsoft all on stage. And um, you know, you, you actually brought up a, a few uh, myths out there about commercial software versus open source and, and the sort of, uh, I don't know, sometimes religious view of open source. I was wondering if you could talk about uh, those uh, that discussion, which you were part of, and then just where is the industry heading? Yeah, so um, let, let's start with the latter, um, and then I'll, I'll circle back to the to the former. Um, so where where the industry is heading, and it's been heading here for a long time, is that the the world operates the, at least the world the, the internet uh, and the web operates on open source. Um, it, it is now uh, you know. The, the question about whether open source has a role in the federal or in, in just in the web is, is a resolved question. Uh, most of the servers uh, are running on, uh, on Linux. Um, you know, most of the websites uh, use uh, some variation of SQLite or uh, some open source uh, database for, uh, for their work, um, what be it Postgres or otherwise. Modern browsers, uh, you know, uh, Firefox and Chrome are open open source, and Microsoft announced that it's going to be using Chrome under the hood. Um, most pro many programming languages are open source languages, so open source is one, right? Like that 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 is that's beside the point. The question now is, how do you take those open source products and turn them into sustainable business models? Um, and you're seeing a lot of innovation, a lot of really cool things happening. Um, some not as cool, frankly. There's there's some uh, there's some stuff that, that I think is going to require a lot of uh, interesting. Uh, and meaningful discussions over the next couple of years, uh, from you know, from uh, from a perspective of what do we want the web to look like, um, but you know, from a from a simple question about whether code should be accessible, whether it should be shareable, whether it should be modifiable, whether people should be able to uh, to, uh, to to use open source, that, that's a that's a that's a resolved question. Um, so that. Uh, that, that's been sort of exciting to see that trend because it used, there used to be so much fear and uncertainty and doubt, and doubt about open source software. And now I think even, you know, only the most, uh, you know, sort of dubious uh, claims would be made that open source shouldn't have a role. What the right role is though, is an important question and that gets back to the business model. Um, and so um, one of the things that I've, I've been 
spending some time thinking about um, is that when we talk about open source in this context of government is that we shouldn't pretend like it's anything other than uh, commercial. Um, and in fact, uh, there's a federal acquisition regulation that defines what a commercial item is and open source, you know, clearly fits the bill. Um, it's, uh, it's software that's made available to the public and people make money off of it or not. Like you, there's nothing that says that it has to be making money in order to be in commerce. And so it is, to me, it's clear that open source is, uh, is a commercial item um, and it should be treated like a commercial item. Uh, but that, that doesn't mean that all business models are treated equal and that all, uh, all uses of open source uh, are beneficial. There, there are some times where you probably want to use a commercial service because you get service level uh, agreements that are beneficial or you may have, uh, you know, you may have a more current version if that's uh, the particular business model that a provider uses or um, you may want um, additional features if that's a particular model that they use. Um, so there are different, uh, there are different um, models that might be in play that would affect an acquisition strategy, right? So putting aside whether it's you know, the, the technology strategy, the type of open source that's being, the type of open source business model may affect the acquisition strategy. Um, but then from a technology perspective, again, not all open source is treated equal. All you have to do is look at, you know, sort of GitHub and see, you know, some repositories that have huge active contribution and then some repositories that have none. Um, and you can get a sense that there's, you know, there's a wide range of, uh, of quality and uh, expectations around open source, uh, which is to say that's good. You, you want that sort of variety. That, that's how uh, you ultimately get good products is not to sort of assume that you're going to get it from one source, uh, the benefit open source, that there is a broad community out there that you can rely on. So in terms of uh, open source uh, to be used uh, in the government context. Uh, so throughout, and that's the, that's really the point of Code California is to have a repository for code so that can be shared across, you know, agencies and, and reused and have a policy and a procedure and, and, and let that um, grow and mature over time. Uh, so th the question is about using open source code, uh, code that's developed for a certain case management system or a certain, uh, operational program, you know, what's your, how do you assess California in terms of uh, what's the potential and, and, and readiness for this kind of thing? Yeah, so I, I think it's kind of a, I, I'll say it's a mixed bag. Um, the potential is huge. Uh, you know, that's, it's, you know, it's a huge government, uh, it's a huge population, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of excellent leadership. Um, and, uh, I think there's a lot of potential for California to be a leader here, um, and frankly, I've been you know been pretty pleased by a lot of the uh, a lot of the effort from from leaders in California. I think it's been it's been very exciting to watch. Um, you know, right now you, you said that I met, you mentioned that I flew out in, uh, to California in December. I got to be honest, sitting here in Wisconsin, I wish I had flown out there right now. Uh, it's pretty pretty cold and miserable, uh, and California seems pretty pretty lovely. Um, but long story short, I think California is in a position to do to do good work. You know, the thing that uh, I would sort of counsel, though, is that California, uh, if California thinks that it should uh, try to do it itself, it's going to be making a big mistake. Um, I, the, the benefit of using open source isn't for California to be uh, the only player um, or even to route things through California. It's to be part of the broader community. Um, you know, part of why I opened with, you know, sort of CFPB and data.gov and uh, and some of the work of Sunlight and others um, is that there is a broad community of folks out there, um, and, you know, in who, who came from open source, some who didn't come from open source, um, but who are willing and able to to be part of a um, a larger effort. Um, and so California says, well, everything needs to go through go.code.ca.gov. I, I think that would be a mistake. Um, I think that they that California should really try to do as much as it can. Uh, to use uh, to be part of the open source community and not try to take parts of it in in house if that makes sense. Um, and to that end, you know, I think one of the things I was really encouraged by at the the December event uh, was when Amy uh, Amy Tong, the, the CIO, was talking about implementing open source uh, in in government. It wasn't a mandate, right? It was. It's like yes, you're going to use open source, but it's not like go do 50% open source or do 100% open source. It was how do we provide the resources? How do we actually make it safe for people to use open source? How do we make it clear that you know if you use this library, um, we're not going to come come later and smack you over the head for using this library. 
Um, and I think that's the sort of leadership that uh, that will be helpful to make this to work. Um, is you know the rest of the rest of the world. That's not that's not totally fair, but much of the rest of the world has figured out how to use open source and to make that part of their their business. Um, and government needs to do that as well. Um, what what's great is that the government has um, the the other advantage of being uh, similarly situated to other governments, right? So that if you have some parts of government with the same problem as another part of government or even cross-jurisdictional uh, boundaries, there's really no reason that states should be competing with each other for the delivery of those services. So unlike a traditional corporate environment where if you give your competitor something that harms your own competitive position, that's not the same thing for service delivery. So if you deliver excellent case management uh, in, you know, in the state of California, that doesn't mean that you know, Oklahoma can't also do the same, use, use the same tools that use to deliver case management systems. And so I think that there's an opportunity around open source that's slightly different than from what you'd see uh, in the corporate context, um, but a lot of the practices ought to be the same. So what is your message then to uh, the, the software companies out there, right? What's the opportunity? What would you say to those who are in this business who are uh, evaluating what's the impact and what's the, what's the potential for going in this direction? So I think there are a couple of different things. Uh, you know, I, I think that if you're relying on um, your code base at a point in time to be superior to another product's code base and using that as like the only differentiator, you're, go- you're going to lose because um, software moves so fast um, that, you know, your point in time solution is not going to be the long term point in time solution. So I think that using open source is an accelerant for companies. Um, companies that know how to use open source effectively can take advantage of what's happening outside of their corporate and uh, their environment um, and bring that into their, you know, into their solution quickly. Um, and, you know, to the extent that they can use that to create opportunities for you know, their, their other vendors and to the extent that the government can create sort of conditions for collaboration as opposed to direct competition between vendors. Um, I think open source has a lot of potential. Um, so I, I think that if the government is serious about using open source uh, in, a, in a good way, um, it can create more collaborative conditions. It can allow for companies to work you know, across the you know, sort of across company lines um, to deliver on behalf of the uh, the public, which is good. Um, I think that companies can use tools that are th- that are similar to what they might use outside of the government context, which is good. Um, and I think the the reusability is good for uh, for the public broadly. So I think that there's a there's a nice there's a sort of a nice uh, culmination of uh, factors um, that open source sort of lets you sort of organize around. Um, but, you know, it's, it's one of those things where you still, at the end of the day, you still need to have people deliver. You can't just say, all right, well, I've got my solution. I'm ready to move and, you know, and hope that it all works. So shifting gears just a little bit on a different topic, uh, the, the topic of failure or making mistakes. Um, I was wondering if, you would sh- if you'd be willing to share any, uh, any sort of confrontations or mistakes or explanations that you had to give. Uh, it's your time, it, you know, 18F. So uh, can you share some of your experience? Sure. Um, so I, I usually open this sort of conversation with, you know, there's, there's this perception that government is afraid to fail. And that's actually not true. Um, government is afraid to fail unpredictably. Um, the government fails all the time. It is, it is a, more often than not, you're going to screw up. Something is not going to be delivered. You know, technology is no exception. Most technology projects in the government fail. They're over budget. They don't quite work. Um, you can almost always pick any government URL and find like deep failures in whatever they deliver. So like failure is not actually the, uh, the, the problem. It's how do you get people to fail in the right way? Um, so don't fail um, so big that you are find yourself five years in and say, oh my God, we spent five years doing something and we don't have anything to show for it. Um, so failing, you know, failing fast is something that I think is uh, it's, it's funny, government, um, government actually struggles to fail fast because the, the, you know, the usual time cycles are built around long-term failure, right? So if by, by sort of rethinking and resetting and saying, all right, what's the way that I can, uh, I can sort of get something done, which is another, like, you know, there's, there are two types of government things. Like if you fail, that's really bad, but if you get something done, that's really good. Um, and so trying to figure out how you can get things done faster um, is, is 
you know, that's sort of the secret sauce. Um, and what I was able to do in government is like, even if I failed, I was really, and I, boy, I failed a lot. Um, even if I failed, I was pretty explicit about what I was trying to do, both at the beginning and when I was going down. Like when things were going down and, you know, wasn't, wasn't getting the results that I'd hoped for, I communicated that. I said, look, this isn't going well. Uh, you know, this could, we could, you know, in the context of ATF, it was like, well, you know, we could lose this, uh, we could blow this project, it could, it could be a disaster, it could end up on the front page of the Washington Post, here's what we need, here's what I think we should do about it, you know, and, and that happens. Um, my, favorite, my favorite stories about this are when I was really explicit up front about the fact that this could be a bad idea. So when uh, we did the Agile BPA, there was an interview that I, uh, that I had with uh, one of the local news uh, sort of organizations, um, and in the, in the conversation, I was talking about failure and, you know, this particular Agile VPA could, could fail. And of course, you know, the headline was the next day was 18F says 18F Agile BPA could be a failure. And inevitably, I was going to get called up to the front office. And so I went up to the front office and they said, Dave, what the hell is that? And I said, it's a direct quote. <laughs> you know, like, it's, it's something that I said, I believe that this is true. This could be a disaster. Um, and I didn't get fired. Uh, which t told me everything that I needed to know about like the ability to take some of the risks uh, down the road. Um, similarly with a micro purchase platform, um, you know, I think, I think uh, I might have the only blog post in governments that opens with this might be a terrible idea. Um, and, you know, it, it, it turned out we, we bombed that one too. Um, like we, we had a result that uh, was totally unexpected, um, got us some, you know, both positive and negative press. Um, but really validated for us that there was uh, there was something to this to this platform, and so it allowed us to to move forward. Um, so I think you know I, as I as I look back on my own time in government, um, failure is actually more normal than people give it give credit to. Um, the hard part is that we don't have really good language to to name it. Um, we still struggle. Um, I think not just in government, even outside of governments, to, to talk about learning in a, in a healthy way. Um, and so learning, um, you know, some, some things are actually learned, some things aren't learned. Uh, and so when we don't learn it, uh, we, we treat it as a failure. And so I think if we, can, if we can think about how we can do a better job of learning faster, um, learning more safely, um, I think we'd be, we'd be better off. I was wondering if you could talk about um, requirements gathering, the sort of typical requirements gathering uh, function, uh, user-centered design, modular procurement, which we've already talked about, and how does that all relate to openness? Yeah. Open, open in government. So, uh, you know, I've actually been thinking a lot about this problem. It's, it figures prominently in the opening chapters of, of the book. Um, you know, the, the problem with buying um, is that unless you know what you're buying, you're you're going to have a problem, um, you know, and, and if you're buying something very expensive that you don't understand, that, that's going to be a problem. Um, it's one thing to buy, you know, buy a pen, you know, all right, go buy a pen. Um, buying a billion pens is hard. Um, it's one thing to buy, uh, you know, buy a license, uh, buying a license for an entire, or, you know, government of 100,000 people uh, or, you know, several million people is actually hard. Um, and so there's a, there's a scale question that makes some procurements difficult, uh, but there's also just a, you know, when it comes to software delivery, there's also a user need problem. Um, it's hard to know um, what users needs are unless you have actually interacted with users. Um, it's hard to know what features are going to be valuable to the user um, and to, you know, to the organization unless you have the feature. Um, and so one of the, uh, one of the things that I think user centered design strong product management um, and uh, clear, uh, clear pathways for prototyping and, um, and sort of continuous delivery afford is the ability for governments to, um, to learn about what its needs are over time rather than trying to figure it all out up front. Um, and that, that is not, um, it's historically sort of misunderstood in procurements because you have to have a bona fide need in order to procure something. So you say, all right, well, if there's no bona fide need, um, we can't go buy it. And so people have equated bona fide need with the actual requirements to fill the bona fide need. But there's a difference. People, people have a, may have a problem, but they may not know what the solution to their problem is. Um, and so if we can think about just, uh, procurements less as, all right, I have a need, what are the requirements? 
deliver and instead say, what's my need? How do I better discover that? How do I better understand how to best meet that need? And how do I minimize the amount of time and effort that I waste in getting to solve that need um, is, uh, is part of the art you know, of, of digital services. And, and I think it's, um, if, if there's nothing else that uh, you know, 18F and USDS and some of the other organizations have brought to, to the table, it's about the importance of starting with the user. It's about the importance of thinking about uh, solutions not as a one-time fits-all solution, uh, but rather as a set of uh, unique needs uh, for service delivery and thinking about how we can best change our processes and practices to meet those needs. All right, so we're about halfway through the hour, uh, and I wanted to give our audience a chance to ask questions. So uh, I know we have some uh, questions here in the chat, um, but we have some comments. Uh, well, why don't we go ahead and just um, open the uh, microphone for anyone who wants to ask Dave a question. Hey, this is Tom Webster from Bakersfield. Hey, Tom. Hey, so um, I am a uh, actually a local government webmaster for the city, and um, I know, right? Um, we're working on I'm and I'm part of the National Association of Government Webmasters, and there's a huge at the local level people trying to get that type of service, you know, because we're spending, you know, per cycle three years we're spending fifty thousand to a hundred thousand dollars every single time we do it and it has that procurement issue right we go in we open the box we get it it looks shiny the outside of the box looks shiny and then suddenly we're just like oh this is this is not exactly and then the support is um i'm sure you've seen that thing of the swing set right that cartoon of the swing set by the yeah okay so <laughs> i'll take it from your response there that you've seen that so um so anyway, so we're working at a very local level. We're starting to put together a group of people who want to come up with this. Um, what's, for you, I guess my question would be, um, sorry about that, hang on. What would be the, uh, perfect timing, uh, what would be the, um, the pitch that we would take up to the city, um, to the city manager, to city council's office that we would use to, to say, hey, we need to, you need to give us a long, long leash on this let us fail a few times before we can come out with a product? Uh, it's a great question. Um, and it's, I, I think I'm going to offer a counterintuitive solution. Um, and it's, uh, you know, I, I say this at the risk of, you know, you, you, you probably want to talk about some of the internal dynamics before you offer this sort of verbatim. Um, but maybe the way that you ask for it is to start smaller. Um, the, the three year cycle is part of your problem. Um, you know, when you go through a procurement, getting anything for the next three years will take a long time. It, it's impossible to even know, um, you know, what, what CMS expectations will be in three years. Um, even if you get through the migration, you've lost time. Um, and so thinking about what you need to do from now until then, uh, you know, and you've got that six month lead time before you even get the procurements completed, um, it, it's probably too long. Um, and so maybe a different way of thinking about it is to say, rather than do the whole thing all at once, what's a smaller chunk that you could do to, to improve the experience, uh, either for the end user or for an internal uh, government user um, to, get, to get better delivery? Is that a different hosting platform? Are there reliability questions? Um, is it sort of a, you know, is it a, a refresh in terms of the, uh, you know, sort of just the look and feel? Um, is it actually removing things from the website? Um, you know, one of the one of the sort of the most uh, common patterns is that you have uh, government websites that are just filled with a bunch of content that nobody knows how to you know to access. Um, and so, thinking about having sort of a, a you know less uh, over information overload might be uh, you know something that you seek to do. Um, you know, I, I think you're you're fortunate in that there are a lot of folks uh, in California, in particular, who are doing really interesting work. I remember. Uh, talking to some folks while I was out in California about how they're approaching city, uh, city frankly, websites. Um, and uh, I think there are some good lessons to, to be learned. But my, my instinct is always to go smaller. Um, by going smaller, it gives you the opportunity to clarify um, for yourself where, where you might have the biggest return on investment. Um, and also when you're talking to the city council and to the executive, um, it's an easier sell when you're talking about smaller bucks. If you're talking about the big, you know, hundred plus thousand dollar refresh, they're going to, they're going to have a lot more scrutiny than if you say, you know, I need 5,000 bucks to just go do one small thing 
uh, to improve upon it. You're never, it's never going to be an easy conversation. I've, I've been there. I was, uh, you know, I was scrapping for money when I was uh, in the DC council. Um, but it's, it, it's doable, particularly when you're talking in, you know, sort of five digits as opposed to, or even four digits as opposed to six. Other questions? So I, I've got a qu another question. Um, at the December 12th event, we had Rebecca Woodbury, who is the uh, City of San Rafael Digital Services Director. Uh, we've had a great conversation with her since. That was two weeks ago. Uh, but one of her comments in December was, everything is always better when it's in the open. And she was talking about uh, the culture and government and her intro net website, her employee website that was really internal for her own organization, but yet um, it was open for anyone to look at. I was wondering if you could comment about that. What's better about open? Um, gosh, that's a great, it's a great question. It's a great point. Um, so I'll, I'll describe it both anecdotally um, and then from, you know, personal experience. So anecdotally, um, I, I have seen uh, open source software and closed source software um, and open teams and closed teams, teams that hoard all the information and teams that share all the information. Um, and it's just better work product. I mean, I've just seen that to be true. Um, you know, open source so code can sometimes be garbage. Um, but I've, I found that, you know, a lot of closed source code is garbage. Uh, and uh, open source code tends to be, if you're really focused on it and you have a lot of eyes on it, or you think there are going to be a lot of eyes on it, um, you tend to be a little bit more sensitive to things like documentation and testability and maintainability and the like. It's not universally true, but I, I've seen sort of anecdotally that, that that seems to be a more more consistent pattern. Um, the thing that's interesting uh, from for me personally is that I went from a very sort of closed environment. You know, I was, I was a lawyer. I was a lawyer, so basically everything that I you know every conversation that I had was like protected by some sort of, some form of privilege. It, it seemed like. Um, and going into 18F, which was focused on being open uh, by default from day one, was just a totally different environment. It was just completely different expectations about what you uh, what you shared, um, and in some sense that had um, that created you know some challenges, right? The, there's there's some uh, there's some downside to being transparent about everything. It becomes sort of can become uh, it can slow you down a little bit because you have to sort of go through that uh, that process of uh, over communicating, um, there there may be people that withhold things because they don't want to be public. Like there are there are definitely drawbacks to to sort of you know, radical openness. That said, boy, it was much healthier. I mean, the the ability to um, to be able to know what people were doing and being able to say, hey, you've got the same problem that I've got, um, and also just to get past the fear. Like there's this fear, like oh my god, what if I do something and somebody sees it, and then you've actually done something and nobody sees it, or you've done something and somebody sees it, it's not a big deal. You can just let that go. Like it's very, uh, it's very liberating um, to, be, uh, to be in the open um, in a way that I didn't really expect personally to feel uh, quite as much as I did. Um, working, working in the open is, has been sort of a healthier thing for me just because you're sort of less focused on like, all right, am I, can I share this information with you or can't I share this information with you? If you start from the proposition, I can share this with anybody. Um, it becomes a lot easier to, uh, you know, by default to think about, uh, think about information and, um, and the work that you do. Thank you. All right. So uh, back to our audience, any, any follow-up questions? Okay, well, uh, so one last uh, question, I think, and then we'll go ahead and close out, Dave. Um, so uh, your time at 18F, uh, you guys produced a, a playbook, and I know there's a, there's a lot of information out there. I was wondering if you could just share, like, what's the best practices? You know, where can you find uh, best practices with all of this stuff? So that's a great question. I use a lot of DuckDuckGo and <laughs> just Google around, uh, you know, sort of search the internet. Um, you know, the, there are a couple, I get, well, that's, that, that's part of the answer. Um, Stack Overflow is always good for like technical things. Um, there's so many, there are so many great books out there. There are so many great resources out there. The, the thing that actually I find, I, I have found to be the most um, helpful is, is listening deeply to folks who have been there. And what I mean by been there um, is, you know, folks who have been in government or folks who have been out of government, but sort of government adjacent, um, who are 
who are thinking and writing about important uh, important stuff. So, um, you know, when it comes to to things like research, uh, I'll listen to Sid Harrell. Right, Sid is uh, a brilliant thinker on on research. He was uh, uh, at C Code for America and uh, at eighteen F for a period of time, um, and she will cite a lot of people and you know you know, on Twitter, she's, you know, she's available to, to answer questions on Twitter and the like. Um, and I found that folks like her are, you know, frankly, some of the best resources, you know, we've got. Um, there, are, there are literally thousands of people at this point who have all spent time thinking about digital services, who have spent time thinking about government uh, technology um, and have uh, meaningful things to contribute. Um, it's sometimes hard to get through the, through the noise. Um, there's a lot of bad, you know, bad thinking out there. Um, but when you're able to get to folks, when you're able to start seeing how um, some patterns, um, it becomes sort of validating. So, uh, gosh, one of, the, one of the patterns that, um, that I remember sort of early on um, was uh, when Mikey Dickerson, uh, you know, came to USDS, a lot of the early reporting was on things like just continuous, you know, continuous monitoring, just, just monitoring, just do the basics of monitor your system in production. Um, but, you know, like the fact that that conversation uh, happened and saying like, hey, government, just monitor your applications in production um, has a ripple effect because then you have folks like David Nesting, who uh, is a site reliability engineer, and this is like sort of breaking news. Today, today I think, or maybe earlier this week, he was announced as the deputy CIO for the Office of Personnel Management. Um, and, and what's crazy about that, and I'm going to go off on diatribe for a moment, uh, what's crazy about that is if you recall the OPM breach um, from a couple of years ago, that, that was largely the result of the fact that we weren't monitoring the the equip in production, right? Like that, that was the problem. It's like somebody had, was able to hack into the system. They had root access for a month and nobody knew. Um, and so like, just thinking about like those basic practices, you have that sort of lineage of saying, how do we, how do we just say openly government should monitor to having a site reliability engineer actually running, uh, you know, in part the, the agencies that can benefit from it is uh, itself sort of a, a reflection of the fact that the resources aren't certain. There's not like a single guide out there, um, but rather a community of folks who are thinking about these problems, talking about these problems and sharing their experiences. And I think that, you know, my, I guess that's a long winded way of saying that the best way to, to find out and to learn more is to just become part of the community, um, to spend time listening, to spend time talking, to, to find opportunity for projects to, to jump in on, find something that you care about and find meaningful there, you know, there are code for brigades in various places. Um, you know, there are state agencies are you know desperate for help in every city and county and state that you live in. Um, and so I, I think there's there's just opportunities to contribute, and through contribution, you can actually learn more about how to you know, how to improve the situation. Terrific. Well, I think that's a perfect note to end on. Dave, thank you so much for your time. This has been a great conversation. Uh, thank you to our audience uh, for tuning in today, and uh, be sure to check back on our website, agilegovleaders.org, uh, to uh, see the playback and uh, sign up uh, if you're not involved with AGL already. Um, you can sign up to be a member. Uh, encourage that in the new AGL association. And uh, again, Dave, thank you so much. Absolutely. Thanks again for having me.